Welcome. Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined by my colleague Lillian Corral. Hey Lillian. Hi Lily, how are you? Good, good to see you another week. I know. <laughs> Here we thought. I know. <laughs> My I know. run had ended. <laughs> we thought, yes. Um, for, for audience members who are just joining and who weren't with us last week, um, Lillian um, will be adding another family member, uh, a little girl soon. Um, so, so for all the parents out there, you all know, um, the, the date, the due date is, of, of course, moves around. So we never know. Um, yeah. So I'm so happy that you're here with us to, to have another episode um, talking about the future of our cities. So it's, yes. been, it's been a wild ride. Yeah, no, it, it has been. And I'm excited about today's show, Lily, because um, as you know, I am a, a lover of data. Um, okay. Not everyone is. And so I really love that, that aspect of today's conversation. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about it. I mean, I think there's a couple of things about this. So I think this really gets to um, how we can be looking at um, building more equitable parks and how data can be leveraged to inform, you know, decision making around our green spaces um, and our communities. Um, we'll also look at, um, interesting enough, um, how community driven um, best practices that cities can be used um, for, you know, equitably reimagining their public spaces. Um, so we're also We'll unpack questions on how to support local neighborhood groups, engaging with city government, which, which you know very well, what that can potentially yeah. look like, um, and really shifting the power kind of around the decision making as we work towards common goals in public spaces. Um, and we have a really great example of this um, with the 10 minute walk campaign, um, yeah. which, which now, and Benita can tell us more about this, but I believe hundreds and hundreds of mayors um, have signed up. Um, for this across the country. Um, and so I'm, I'm eager to hear more. Anything else that you want us to tease out of this conversation? I mean, I think you hit it. And I, and I, I just sort of want to highlight that. I mean, I, I think part of why I love the work that we get to do at night is that there really is this very strong focus on how do we shift the power back to the community and yeah. think about engagement and having conversations with folks about this, like, think about engagement not as a luxury, um, but really as a critical part of the process that actually makes our public projects and our public spaces uh, better. And so I think there's a lot of work that Knight is doing across communities that really proves that point. And there's no better time than now um, as cities are really having to reimagine um, their design, what they look like, how their spaces are used yeah. to really like demonstrate that again, it's not just nice to engage the public here and there, it's actually really critical and it's actually gonna be part of the way that we get out of this um, pandemic situation. Yeah. So. Excited about Beautiful. that. Well said, well said for sure, and um, and eager to to tease that out a bit. Yeah. Um, okay. So so I want to welcome uh, Benita Hussain, uh, the ten minute walk director uh, with the Trust for Public Land, and Carrie Entram, the executive director of the North End Neighborhood Organization, a community nonprofit in St. Paul. Um, welcome, Benita, and welcome, Carrie. Thanks for joining us on Coast to Coast. Thank um, you. So I'm going to just do some level setting for how this is going to work. Um, so we're going to take about 15 minutes to do a quick interview between the, the, the two of you and me. Um, and then my colleague Lillian Corral um, will jump in and she's going to be taking questions from the audience live. And so audience members, what you're going to see at the bottom is you're going to see a Q&A um, uh, button down there. And that's where you can put in your questions that, that we can elevate to Benita and Carrie. Um, and if you're watching on Facebook, um, hashtag night live, and you can put your questions there, we will be following them. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, so, so welcome. Thanks guys for joining me. Um, Benita, I want to start with, with you. Um, and if you can just tell us a bit, um, give us some context for what the 10 minute walk campaign is. Um, mm -hmm. How does it work? And, and how does it work specifically in, in cities across the country? Sure. I think you gave a really good high level overview of the work that we do. Um, the 10 minute walk campaign is a national initiative that is led by the Trust for Public Land, alongside uh, several national and community partners, including Kerry, um, really about bringing parks and green space within an easy 10 minute walk of home for all urban residents by 2050. Uh, we have a really strong uh, sense that, you know, we wanna create environments in cities that are greener, healthier, and are engaging city leadership 
as you mentioned, mayors to really drive progress um, you know, in a long-term ambitious way. Uh, we have about 300 mayors signed on to, this, to the initiative. Um, and we really think of ourselves as partners for all of these cities in helping um, make that progress, whether that is helping them figure out how to target their investments in equitable ways, uh, map, mapping, and we'll talk about data in a little bit, um, but also ensuring that there are community voices at the table, um, especially in our most ambitious cities that have demonstrated um, this desire to hit this really high level target. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting national initiative to work on, but with very hyper-local needs and hyper-local impacts um, that we were just really excited to talk to you about today. That's fantastic. Thanks for the overview. And, and that community piece is, is so important for the 10 minute wall campaign. Like what does this look like on the ground in communities? And Carrie, um, you are the example of, of this, of this work um, in, in the North End. Um, so tell us a bit about how the 10 minute wall campaign works um, on the ground in the North End. Um, yep, thank you. First of all, I want to say that I'm not one of the, I'm one of like six, I think, grantees for the 10 minute walk program in St. Paul. So I want to just talk very, very briefly about our organization and the other organizations. We're part of a system of 17 district councils that make up the seven um, very unique neighborhoods in the city of St. Paul. And we actually work to magnify and empower community members from the ground up and have decision making come from the ground up instead of top down. And we also give residents a constructed, established, and ongoing way to give their voices so decisions, once I said, can be made from the bottom up. I think that this campaign really is helping us to build our capacity to be able to do that and to, and to really focus on parks and green space, which is inherently important to, I think, all of our neighborhoods and we're much better to understand now the gaps that we see in some park services especially um, with all of our um, different folks that live in our neighborhoods and to be able to actually ensure that all of our residents have a voice in deciding what should happen to the parks and recreation centers and also the green spaces and for the North End, we have actually been lucky enough to create something called Friends of the North End Parks. So we've started with three of our main parks and we've had a really great response from our community to actually come out and we're meeting in the park, socially distanced, of course, to talk about what should this park look like, what is necessary here, who lives around the park, what improvements we could make. So that group will ultimately encompass all of the parks and green spaces, hopefully in the North End, and they'll advocate and make those connections that are hugely important to us all. That's really helpful. And I, and, and I, and I can see how valuable it would be to be able to clearly understand what the gaps are um, within the community. And, and on top of that, um, how, do we, how do we make sure, and Lillian touched upon this too in, in her mm -hmm. remarks, like how do we really make sure this is resident driven? This is, this is driven by the community. Um, so, so I do wanna dig into that more. Um, but before we get to that, um, Benita, I, I wanna hear a bit more from you. Um, can you talk to us about why this work um, and this work that, that you're doing, the work that Carrie's doing um, during a pandemic is, is, is possibly arguably more relevant than ever. Um, and if you can just tell us, I mean, what, what's so interesting about your position is you're, you're seeing this from a national level. You're learning from a lot of different cities. If you can tell us a bit about what you're, you're seeing and learning um, from, from different communities. Sure. Um, so the I think all of us can agree that sort of now more than ever, we've seen the value of these public spaces um, and nature really in, especially in the last four months. I, you know, I do want to ensure that I'm sort of giving a shout out to many of the mayors and cities that, and communities that have prioritized parks over, you know, the last three years since the campaign was launched. And I think that we, you know, we look to those leaders to help provide the voice of, you know, those in power to in ensure that cities are, and communities are still prioritizing parks and green space. But as we've seen in the last four months, the fact that they have been essential for our mental and physical health and wellness, essential for ensuring that there are spaces for communities to have civic discourse and, and protests and justices in their communities, um, and certainly to ensure that um, 
people still feel connected to each other and they can still see their friends and family. We really have seen the rise at the national level of, of how important these spaces are um, just for us as individuals and communities. I think that as we look to the future and see what will be, you know, a $350 billion shortfall in budgets across the, across the country, um, we feel it's very important to ensure that, you know, parks don't fall to the bottom of the pile when it comes to budget cuts. We really want to make sure that we've, that we've all highlighted this idea that parks are really, really important for communities. Um, and, and we see it happening, you know, communities have come up with really creative ways of ensuring all residents have that access, whether it's through opening streets uh, to pedestrian traffic and bicycle um, and, and bicycles, and then also for restaurants and small businesses to have st street dining. Um, and we're seeing that with, you know, the potential um, rise of outdoor classrooms. I mean, the services that these spaces provide is just essential. And, and, we're, and we think that this is going to be a real national conversation going forward. Um, and I think that the the idea of targeting and making sure these spaces are equitably dis distributed as we talk about sort of data and ensuring that we're helping guide those investments. I think that will continue to be a very, very important part of the conversation as well. I want to, I want to dig a little bit into that, um, Benita, like that, that data piece. Can you, can you tease out like how, how does that, that work, especially as we think about the, the equitable investments? Tell me, tell me how that, that works in, in communities. Yeah. Uh, so we, so the campaign, you know, has 300 cities. We really, again, try to partner with all of them around helping them adopt this 100% target park access, but also making sure that when we're talking about park access, we're not just saying it's about it just plopping down a park space anywhere, right? It's about making sure that the these park spaces are, um, again, equitably distributed, that they're responsive to the community needs and programmed in ways that make sense for those local residents, um, that they have positive outcomes around climate resilience and health and eco economic growth. And so in order to do that, we really have to refine and look at what types of basically map our, our cities and figure out mm. where, are the, where are the places that are most um, in need of parks and green space and the benefits that they provide. So um, at the Trust for Public Lands, we're very lucky that we have some very um, comprehensive data. So on the technology side, we have a, a program called ParkServe, which has mapped um, 14,000 cities and communities um, parkland down to like the very, very most micro level. Um, and we've been able to slice the data across demographics, across age groups, across um, income levels um, and help optimize in each city about five spaces where we think cities can help target their municipal um, investments in, wow. in green spaces. So from a technological level, we have we have the ability to do that, but I'll always, always ensure that when we, we can, you know, engineer our, our way through some problems, but we always have to make sure that community driven data and community feedback is also as important for, and that feedback is as important for um, municipal planning um, as technological data. And that is part of the reason why we have seated grantees like Harry's team um, on the ground in many of our cities to ensure that they have the ability and the space to provide that community level data to ensure again these that the parks are responsive to their communities. No, that, I mean, that's, that's extremely valuable, um, that data that you're providing in the communities. And, um, and what's interesting about this, and I, I heard this the other day, I, I can't remember who said it, but, but it's, it's, it's much more than just proximity um, that, you know, having, at, just, so that not all 10 minute walks are, are created equal either. Mm -hmm. So it's thinking about that piece too, which is, which I think is really important. Um, so, so Carrie, um, I want to, I want to talk a bit about, um, about this, um, data piece and and how this actually works on the ground um, in the north end and 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 how um, what are you seeing and learning um, uh, and how how is your community um, pivoting in real time um, during this pandemic yeah I'm, that's a that's a really really good question for neighborhood organizations to take a real look at that about how we previously before covid engaged our community compared to how we're doing it now with mm -hmm. especially with all of the stay-at-home orders and all of the thought processes we all have including our residents with you know distance learning and so many complications and challenges so i think at least nino the north end has really restructured the way we're doing things we're doing a lot more direct mailing we're doing actual phone calls and we are meeting in parks we are actually mm -hmm. having meetings in parks on monday night they had a 
neighborhood meeting, the safety meeting right at Marydale Park using social distancing. So we're, that is one spot that neighbors, I think, feel a lot more comfortable having a meeting instead of face-to-face. And what we're also doing is we took a survey. Now this kind of data is more on a neighborhood level than a, a national or city level. We're actually doing a survey talking about, and you're right, it's not about proximity. It's about how people can get to parks, what they mm-hmm. can see when they get there. Are there restrooms? Are there hand washing stations? Are there baby changing stations? Are there, are there um, gathering spaces for larger gatherings? All of that is going to play into what we hope to ultimately figure out about what our parks and how our parks can serve our residents best. Mm -hmm. And it really is, and I know Benita touched on that, but to us and some of our neighbors, because we are highly have a lot of refugees, a a very large number of refugees living in the North End, that it really is geographical and social isolation has always been a concern, especially when some folks automatically move into larger apartment complexes. So getting out and talking to the folks and getting them out into the parks and doing culturally relevant situations um, and activities is hugely important to us. Mm. So it's all about just this complication about how we are all handling COVID and handling how people are thinking and their priorities have changed so much. But parks we see is still a huge priority, at least in the North End, because they're being used dramatically more Mm -hmm. this time of the year, this year, than last year, especially neighborhood parks. So you're seeing that demand and you're able to maybe potentially link that demand to the budgeting, right? Within St. Paul. You're absolutely right. And it's so, yes. And it's so much easier to actually be out there and do clipboards and talk to people. Mm -hmm. So even social distancing when they're already at the parks Mm -hmm. and trying Mm -hmm. to grab them like in an event or something. So yeah, ultimately what we do and what we learn from with our friends of the North End parks and with our surveys and with our face-to-face and one-to-one discussions will ultimately, it'll segue into the parks piece of our Com- mm-hmm. our neighborhood comprehensive plan that is ultimately adopted into the city's comp plan and probably next year we're hoping so this is just hugely exciting for us to have this work move forward yeah yeah and, yeah, and eventually get funded and if you don't mind me adding on to that i was, I was going to say the reason why you know we're so excited about working with the district councils in the twin mm-hmm. cities because i mean mayor carter um you know the, the comp plan of the comp plan 2040 does include again, this high ambitious goal of bringing all residents within a 10 minute walk of home, uh, a park within a 10 minute walk of home. And again, there's the proximity piece, but the fact that we have very um, active civil society, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that's really has a seat at the table, helping build their plans at the local level, helping that feed into the municipal plan. Um, it's just a very commendable example of the work that I think in an ideal state, we have that top down grassroots level conversation happening. Um, and and the, that's the work that we'd love to see scaled across the country. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, and, and Benita, you highlighted this, but, but, you know, budgets are tight right now. And, and so being able to make a clear case is, is very important, um, especially at, at the neighborhood level. We are at the 15 minute mark. I do want to make sure that, that in our answers moving forward, we can, we can potentially talk about the rebuild too, and, and what that, that can, that can look like. But, but I want to call in Lillian um, to elevate some of the questions that we're hearing from the audiences and, and then we'll, We'll, um, I'll come back in about 10 minutes. Great. Um, well, uh, great discussion, ladies. Um, I'll start first with a question around whether it, it seems to me it strikes at like the permanence of this kind of work. So one of our audience members asked if COVID magically went away tomorrow, does that change your approach? Or do you think this is really the way that cities should be designing um, the communities of the future? And COVID is in some ways an opportunity to kind of just accelerate and, 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 and move quickly on it. So, so I can weigh in there. Um, the, I, I think the pandemic and again, um, sort of the civic discourse that's happening at the local level, both again highlighted how important it is to have green space, certainly at a permanent level, but we've also seen how communities can get quite creative with um, offering temporary spaces and pop-up opportunities. Um, but more than anything, it's the, the issue around having places for people to congregate and connect with each other is very clear. As a, there's, a, I think, a real case, case around that. And I think that, um, you know, all of, it's not a, just about 
parks and green space, what we're talking about is really transforming cities and, re and reimagining cities, right, to be greener, to think about them as being more climate resilient, to be healthier. Um, we, this is why the campaign, you know, we work with city leadership, but we also think it's important for us to bring in um, folks from the transportation field and, and from the climate field to really talk about the ways of re rebuilding in a much more holistic way that is healthier for all people in cities. Carrie, do you see any changes happening if, 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 we, if our situation were to change um, pandemic wise or you think this work is, is going to stick? I think the work is gonna stick. I think the only difference because of COVID is we've changed the way we've worked and the way we're trying to um, do the work. It hasn't really, it's not going to really ups, um, upset like the apple cart or upset the timelines that we have. It's just holding off on things and actually just rethinking the way we connect with people. Mm -hmm. Great. So there's, a, you know, building on the, the way we connect with people, there's a couple questions about just getting more specific, both in terms of the approach you're taking. So, um, so Carrie, you had mentioned, you know, meeting at parks, but can you talk a bit more about specific strategies for engagement when you can't do the traditional face-to-face? -face? And then there's also a couple of questions of, could you be more specific about the kinds of questions and the kinds of interact, you know, the kinds of interactions you're having with folks as you're, as you're having this engagement? Um, yes, we are, um, we haven't really changed the way we work because we've always had a hybrid model about how, how we work with people and how we engage our community, but we are now doing a little bit more like everyone else is, is, is scheduling Zoom meetings and then trying to actually, since we really can't do a lot of face-to-face, -face, like I'm saying, it's, it's, it's really challenging. And that's, that's a very, very good question. But sometimes it's a little bit of a difficult question to actually pinpoint exactly what we're doing. We have um, a very diverse neighborhood and we have a lot of folks that are not on the internet that are not mm -hmm. able to pop on and do a survey. So doing it paper-wise, we have paper surveys available in little free libraries that people can do that. So it's the, the lack of meeting face to face and doing larger scale events has really put our engagement piece a little bit behind. But I can't say that it's not going to be business as usual and we're not going to be able to continue to do this. Yeah. Benita, any any other insights you have from from across the country on, on the the types of approaches that people are exploring in this in, new in, in terms of engagement? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, just very similar to what Carrie was saying, just, you know, figuring out, I mean, the technology is very important. Um, meeting in these open spaces is very important. But again, I think that, um, you know, thinking about this in an equitable way, right, it's, I think the question will always remain, how are we making sure that we're reaching out to our most hard to reach communities? Um, and I think that that is something that we sort of look to our community partners to help us decipher. Right. And there is a question, there was a question in here, an example from um, an audience member about an experience they'd had in San Francisco. And this is not atypical, where there is a lot of engagement. And then the, you know, the design of the park doesn't really include the community input that was provided. How do you all ensure that the, the work that you do with community really does get incorporated into the outcome? Um, I could answer a little bit of that real quickly. We've had two, we've had three projects. One was Troutbrook Nature Sanctuary that the community spent almost 20 years to get the two trails connected. Another one is Sylvan that they just did one large artificial turf for soccer because kids just and people just are not playing the baseball anymore. So we worked on that with new play areas and then Marydell Park got a new play area in Catal courts. And I will tell you that I think sometimes, fortunately, it depends on how the parks department handles their piece of community engagement. St. Paul, at least the North End, has been just lucky enough to have people that go out there and actually do the community engagement, that want people to talk about it, want moms to say, well, if you put this bench so close to this, you know, this is going to be an issue with this piece of play equipment. So we've been lucky enough to have a lot of engagement that way through Parks and Rec and then working with the staff at the design departments coming in and figuring out the designs and, and looking at all of that. I mean, there was like 
12 moms and dads and other community members that really designed the playground equipment at Sylvan. So we've been fortunate enough to be able to work like that. Great. Um, I'll just tease out um, two more questions that I think are really practical and interesting. So one, um, on the funding side of things, are you seeing federal dollars that can help support work around parks? And or um, there's another question in the queue of, of how you see the potential to use community benefits agreements to um, to also assist in the development of these um, spaces. Um. So in at, the, at the federal level, we were really excited about the fact that um, the Land Water Conservation Act has been, a fund has been fully funded. That just came into um, a law about a week and a half ago. Um, and so our hope as a Trust for Public Land has been working on that issue for about 15 years, 15, 20 years to ensure that we could draw down that money towards municipal governments and communities that really are in highest need. Um, so we, we are seeing that happen um, in the, at, the, at the sort of federal down to local level. Um, and we'll just continue to work in that way. I think that um, just wanted to speak very quickly about some of what we're seeing around um, community engagement, uh, just in response to Carrie's question, uh, response a little bit, which is that you know we don't want to necessarily hold communities feet to the fire or cities feet to the fire, but we think the resources and the funding question is really important. Um, you know, we hope that the work that we do helps encourage municipal governments and leaders to reallocate resources and reprioritize this idea of community engagement um, and ensure that potentially that we could they could hire staff that really has can go out to those communities and ensure that that connection is there. We think that the work that we're doing from a, a private funding perspective with Carrie's team and others across the country is helping with that. But we think a lot of our sort of overarching um, engagement work with cities is hoping, we're hoping to encourage that across the country as well. Great. And then lastly, um, and I'll turn it over to Lily, any opportunities you, you've seen or you think there could be with community benefits agreements? Is that for Carrie? Um, for either of you. Um, I know at our end, we really haven't really um, thought of that at this point in time, but I will say that any additional funding from anywhere certainly does assist us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the 10 minute walk really helps our community in um, getting more equitable disbursement of investment and getting these conversations going about creating, you know, safe and really welcoming spaces that are culturally relevant for our neighborhood. And I think that when we don't, and small, as being a small, very small organization, when we don't have the capacity to add more and we don't have the funding to add more, some things like this just might have taken more of a back seat than a forward seat. Not that we don't want to work on it, it's just that our capacity is sometimes so, so much smaller. And being able to have the 10 minute walk, we've been able to have our community organizer work directly on this for, for hours. So it really is a huge benefit. Yeah, right. and certainly we see a lot of our own cities um, leveraging community benefit funds and agreements as well as impact fees and a lot of sort of creative ways of working with local developers um, and communities on driving funding. Great. Well, well, we'll emphasize that the website to the 10 minute walk is on our chat. And then Lily, if you want to come back out um, yeah. and close this out. Great, great. Thank you. And, and um, thanks, uh, Lillian. Um, Benita and Carrie, I, we, we do have a, a, a minute left. And I would love to just invite you to, to just make a, a final um, you know, ha have a final comment on, on what you see as the potential opportunity um, in this moment in time, in this moment in time around COVID, in this moment in time of, of the racial reckoning that we're going on in our country around public spaces. Um, so Benita, just, just 30 seconds, if, if you could just tell us um, what is the opportunity that we have right now? I mean, the opportunity is really about as, as you know, the Knight Foundation, as our funder, the JPP Foundation, we're all sort of talking about is, again, reimagining our cities to be healthier and greener and to really see the benefits that we've seen over the last four months and not not let that message uh, fall to the bottom. Right? The, the cities need nature or kids need nature mm -hmm. um, and parks and green space are essential critical infrastructure for cities uh, now more than ever. And, you know, as we get beyond the pandemic and all of these um, the sort of the crises, we really will continue to drive for that message and work with our leaders on, on ensuring that's, uh, that's a sustainable solution for all of us. Great. 
Carrie, um, at a neighborhood level, what do you see as the opportunity? Well, I think the biggest opportunity for us right now is taking a look at the park systems throughout um, our neighborhood and mm -hmm. other parts of the city of St. Paul and really ensuring that, that folks can actually access the park safely and we can rid some of the barriers or, or, and work on some of the barriers that mm -hmm. make it difficulty, difficult for people to get to the parks, like a busy street or railroad track. We all are, are looking at that. So I really think that that is, it's a benefit to actually look at that and then to see actually who's using the parks and what is really necessary to have people to continue to use the parks. Great, great. Well, 10 minute uh, wall campaign, an amazing resource in our communities across the country. Thank you for joining us and, and chatting about this really important topic. Um, and, and I am also excited, uh, Lillian, about next week, which I don't think you'll be joining next week. Definitely but, not. <laughs> Um, we will miss you. Um, yes. but next week we, um, we have Dan Biederman um, on and he is going to be talking about um, activation and placemaking. Um, what does that look like during a pandemic? Um, so it should be really interesting. Of course, he works um, all across the country um, and it should be a really fun uh, conversation. So with mm -hmm. that, I will see you later. Thank you. Thanks, Finita. Thank Thanks, you. Benita. Thank Thanks you. Carrie. Bye. 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 Thank you.